thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the good things you've done in our lives. We just thank you that we can come before you and hear your word. Uh, we can read it. We can get into it. And, and you've given us this great gift of your word. And we just pray that you would guide us even more today to be the people you've called us to be, Lord. We just thank you for, for worship and songs where we can worship you. We thank you for church where we can be conformed more to your image by getting together and having iron sharp and iron. We thank you for all this, and we just pray that that's what you would do for us this morning. You would help us to sharpen each other and learn more about how you want us to live. Lord, help us all to be receptive to what your word uh, says this morning, and just pray that you would open up our hearts and minds so that we hear from you. Lord, we, we your people. We want to be who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we began our series on the seven deadly sins. And we talked about the strange theology of sin in our world today. And we looked at it in two parts. We looked at it in the sense that much of what the church says about sin is wrong <laughs> and unscriptural. And then, but also, that doesn't mean that there isn't a theology of sin in our culture. There's actually a very well-developed theology of sin, and it's extending itself and becoming more and more powerful. And the problem we talked about in the church is that the church minimizes sin because it constantly wants to apologize for its so-called judgmental past. You know, when they took sin so seriously that it used to guide our society in wise ways. <laughs> I mean, for example, the occasional heartbreak that was caused by how harshly a mother who had a child out of wedlock might have been bad, but it was nowhere near as bad as what happens today with the countless amount of children who are born out of wedlock and the abuse and the neglect and the fatherlessness that comes from that. Our culture swung from one pendulum way over to another one, which I consider far, far worse. And it's done that in many different ways today. And not only does the church minimize sin too much, it contradicts much of what the Bible says about sin. And I went through and gave many different examples of that. But, this also, but we also established the fact that this doesn't mean that there isn't a theology of sin in our culture. We looked at how the secular world sees sins like white privilege and the progressive definition of racism, and that they are just twisted ideas that originate in the Bible. Biblical concepts twisted in heretical ways. And there will always, always, always be a theology of sin in the culture. And we have to understand this. And it should make us not afraid to talk about sin and major on sin and make it an important part of everyday life and our public discussions because there is always a theology of sin. And anyone who works in a workplace knows that that is true because you know there are certain things that if you say, you'll get yourself in trouble in that workplace because there is a theology of sin at work forcing you to conform to a particular way of living. Am I wrong? Is that not correct? Wherever you are, whether it's in the workplace or school, wherever you are, it exists. All that we're drawing from the public sphere causes is that others have stepped in to push their idea of sin, and they are harming society in incredible ways. So we are not going to be both afraid to offend ourselves and others outside the church because we recognize that it's good to be offended when you are committing offenses. It's good to be challenged when we are doing what is wrong. And we're going to attack sin at its roots. So I have to ask this question today, leading off last week's message, what is the root of sin? What is at the heart of sin? So I just believed for many years that at the heart of sin was pride. That's what I thought. I thought that that was the root of sin. And when you look at the fall in the Garden of Eden, you see that the devil fell in his pride and that Adam and Eve became very prideful. Therefore, pride must be the root of all sin. But I was wrong because this is a misunderstanding. Yes, pride is a terrible sin, but sin starts deeper than that. And so what we're going to look at this morning is the root of the sin, which is desire turned bad. And we're going to explore that in our sermon this morning. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at how to start the battle against it. So we're going to start by looking at the fall again in Genesis 3, verses 1 to 6, what I want you to do, we're going to read this passage, and I just want you to ask a simple question. Does this passage teach that pride caused the fall or something else? So read with me Genesis 3, verse 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the 
fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise... She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, we were here not that long ago. We did this in our Genesis series last year. Now, who is the serpent? What is the serpent? The serpent is the devil, isn't he? The the ancient serpent, the, the dragon, the deceiver that was referred to, that Jesus said was a liar from the beginning. Now, he is, what does he represent? What does the serpent represent? Evil, but more specifically, chaos. The serpent represents chaos, destruction, the breaking down of the correct order. And how does he do that? He does that not first by awakening pride. That comes, but something deeper, something that drives pride, and that is desire. If we look at the fall of Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14, we see what caused him to fall was Desire, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. There is no doubt that Lucifer became filled with pride here. Pride comes before a fall. We've heard that statement. It's a proverb. But before pride comes desire, corrupted desire turned to lust. And what did Lucifer desire? What did Lucifer desire? What did he want? What did he want? He wanted to be. The morning star wanted to be like the bright morning star. The lesser light wanted to be like the great light. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. He forgot his place, didn't he? He forgot his proper place was to reflect the light of God, not be the light. Desire, when conceived, gave birth to sin. And this is precisely what the devil did with the woman and the fall and the man in the Garden of Eden. First, very cleverly, what he does is he sows doubt about the word of God. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, for some reason, when the woman quotes the command here, she gets it wrong by adding to it. Either this is because she misunderstood it or Adam didn't teach it properly. We're not exactly sure why. But for our purposes this morning, what is it that the, actual, the devil is actually doing in this account? He awakens desire. Genesis 3, 4 to 5, But the serpent said to the woman, For you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He plants that desire in her heart. See, all she had to do was stretch out and eat. Just take the fruit, whatever fruit it was, we don't know. It's often tomato. tomato. If it was a tomato, then why? the fall would have never happened, I think. <laughs> it had to be something good. It was pro- Let's go with tomato. Let's just say she took the tomato, <laughs> just had to take her hand and eat it if she wanted to be like God, or as the sons of God, depending on your translation, desire. The devil was twisting their desire, twisting their wants. The devil awakened them the desire to be more than they were supposed to be, to be more than they were in an ungodly way. And this is precisely how James tells us that sin is awakened. James 1, verse 13 to 15, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. 
You know, I've always known about this verse for a long time, since the first time I read the book of James, but I only made the connection to Lucifer and the fall very recently. Go figure. <laughs> Sometimes things take a long time to click. But offering Eve the apple would have meant nothing if Eve was not awakened to the desire to be more than she was supposed to be. And the same with Adam. This desire is at the heart of all of our sin issues and problems in this world. To be tempted is not wrong. To be tempted is not wrong. Just say no. But the problem is, is when we are tempted, we let the desire for what we want to rush over us and take us over and build up in us, and then it becomes lust, and it gives birth to sin, and sin brings forth death. I couldn't choose which picture to use, so I went with that one and this one. After we attempted the devil, he's sitting there smiling. And that's true. After we attempted and we fall into that temptation, what does the devil do? He smiles. He laughs. Because he loves to see us destroyed. Now, I need to say before we go any further here that not all desire is wrong. I need to point this out. We human beings, we are dependent beings. We, that means that we need other things for us to exist. Therefore, we need to desire those things. Psalm 37 verse 3 to 4 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So it's not wrong to have desire. We were created to have desire. Not all desires are wrong. It's important to understand that. What's, what's, what's important is that we have desire for the right things. We were, desired to, we were created to desire God, to desire certain comforts, to desire friendship, family, all sorts of things. What we need to do is make sure that our desires are conformed to his will. In fact, it would be heresy to say that we should get rid of all desire. There's a name for that. It's called Buddhism. And that's what Buddhism teaches, that because desire is the, the source of all our problems in the world, we just have to no longer desire things. But that would make us mere robots. In fact, horrifying robots, wouldn't it? So we have to recognize that desire is a good thing. Even things like sex are good things to desire. Proverbs 5, verse 15 and 18 to 19. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. In other words, desire your wife. Desire your wife sexually. Desire her regularly. Trust me, if you do this right, your wife will love you for it. If she knows that your desire is for her and her alone, it will go well with you. And vice versa, the other way as well. So it is clear that desire is not wrong. It is a good thing. It is something we are created to have. We are created to have a longing for God in our hearts. We are created to desire many things. For example, Deuteronomy 12, verse 20. Again, another example. When the Lord your God enlarges your territory, as he has promised you, and you say, I will eat meat, because you crave meat, you may eat meat whenever you desire. And people say the Bible is hard to obey. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, sure, some of it is. But that's not a hard one to obey, is it? <laughs> okay, I might have some meat for lunch. <laughs> Sounds good. Desire is a good thing if it's directed in the right way. The problem is that we allow our desire to become lust or envy, or the other side of envy, which is covetousness. In fact, the King James Version translates James chapter 1, which we read before, 13 to 15. This is how it translates it. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust. Remember, we read it before in the English Standard Version. It said desire. Here it says lust. And enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Why is it in one translation translated desire and in the other translated lust? It's because it's the same word in Greek and they, they overlap. Because these two things, one thing can easily become the other thing. Desire can easily be turned to lust. And the truth is that happens too much. Too often does desire become wrong and it becomes sin. It becomes lust very quickly. It turns green with envy very quickly. It covets what other people have very quickly. And why is this? Well, for the non-Christian, it's because they are a slave to sin. 
Romans 6.16 says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of disobedience, which leads to righteousness. You see, the non-Christian has no power to say no to sin. They are enslaved to it, and the only way that they can be broken out from that slavery is by trusting in Christ. And for those of us who already trust in Christ, yes, we have been released from that slavery to sin, but we still wrestle with the old man. We still wrestle with the flesh. As Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 16 to 17, But I say, walk by the Spirit, as you, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Now, there's different ways to explain what Paul is talking about here. Some people prefer the explanation of the two dogs inside of you that are fighting. I always like to think that one of them's a chihuahua because they're just so aggressive. Does any dog want to fight more than a chihuahua? Any dog? There are fighting dogs that are like, come on, chihuahua, calm down. <laughs> they're so aggressive. That's one illustration people like, but I actually prefer a different illustration. I like to liken it to this, that in our unsaved state, before we are saved, we are chained to sin. And we're, it's like a big iron ball that we take with us wherever we go, and it drags us down. And just when we think we've got it under control in one direction, it swings us around in the direction towards another sin because it's always with us. But when we become a believer, what happens is, is that chain is snapped and the ball, of, the ball of sin is broken, but we still have the chain. We still have the chain wrapped around our legs. It's still with us everywhere we go. We can say no to it easier than we could before, but it can still get entangled in things and cause us to get wrapped up into things and drag us down if we allow it. The whole chain will one day be removed, but until that day, it lives with us and we can get caught up in things if we allow it. And our problem is, our big problem is, we like it sometimes when that happens. We sometimes like those sinful desires and we meditate on them and we allow them to entrap us and we let it reel us in. Because desire becomes lust, and we meditate on lust, and we allow it to give full birth to sin. So before we go any further, what we need to do is to define these enemies we're talking about this morning. What is lust? Lust is a wrong desire for someone or something, or a desire for someone or something we should not have, especially in regards to sex, but also food, power, money, Etc. Covetousness is, is the desire for someone else's possessions or spouse. And I don't mean to have the same thing as them, but to have specifically their spouse, their possessions. Envy is the resentment for the person who has what you want. It's that anger, it's that resentful feeling building up in you because they have something that you wish you had. Lust says, I want to have you, or I want to have that and will give myself over to get it. Envy says, I hate you because you have that. And covetousness says, I want what he has, not the same thing, the very thing that he has. You see that in kids, like kids just covet uncontrollably so often, don't they? <laughs> One kid's got a toy, you know, and the other kid wants that toy straight away. <laughs> Can't wait, not even five minutes. And it's just constant fights over this. One, they, like two minutes ago, they were happily playing with their toy. Just happily playing. And then their brother walks by with the toy. They see it. They want it. What's with that? Covetousness. We don't get rid of it as adults. We just learn to moderate it a little bit. But it still affects us in many ways. They're still learning to control it as little children. See, all of these things can get you killed, literally. How many men or women have been killed by a jealous spouse because they committed adultery, because of lust? How many people are consumed so much with hate because of what other people have, so much with resentment that it literally kills them by, break, by causing them to have a heart attack? That happens. That happens. And how many people, because of covetousness, fall into theft or some other kind of dishonesty to try and get what other people have and it leads to their death? And that's an extreme example, but that's what these things can lead to. Corrupted desire is the root of all of these things. Corrupted desire is at the heart of all of them. Eve desired wrongly to be like God. And we too often desire things that we ought not. 
So what we need to do, if we haven't already, and I'm hoping that we have already, but if we haven't already, we need to begin the fight. So next week we're going to delve into sin, into lust, envy, and covetousness more deeply. And what I want to do is I want to give you examples of all of these from the scriptures, and then I want to give you a strategy of how to fight these things. And I want to give you a strategy which I've taught myself specifically how to fight lust based on the Proverbs, and hopefully it'll be helpful to you. And it's, it's, it's ba it comes right out of those passages. And it's actually, those passages in Proverbs are really ha helpful and practical in helping us to fight these things. And we're going, what we're going to do this week, though, uh, because we don't have time to go into all of that, what I just want to do is to look at how this fight begins. Who's heard of Sun Tzu? Sun Tzu. Who's Sun Tzu? Have you heard of Sun Tzu? Some people are like, yeah, sort of familiar. I think so. Sun Tzu, the ancient Chinese general of strategy. Okay, you might not have heard of Sun Tzu, but you've heard this saying, know your enemy. That was said by Sun Tzu. What he actually said, oh, I should have written down the actual quote. I didn't actually put it on the PowerPoint. I'm like, should I put it on the PowerPoint? Then I didn't do it. But yet what he actually said is, know your enemy. Uh, hang on, let me get it right. If you do not know your enemy or yourself, you will lose 100 out of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not your enemy, you'll win half of those battles. But if you know yourself and you know your enemy, you'll win 100 out of 100 battles. And it's really important that we need to know ourselves and we need to know our enemy. And part of knowing yourself is knowing who your allies are. When you go to war, what do you do? When you go to war, you need to know who's going to fight with you, don't you? That's why Australia needs a better military, because if we need to go to war, we, we can't rely on our, enemy, our allies as much as we used to be able to. But when you go to war, you need to know who your allies are. And who is our ally in war against sin? Who is the greatest ally we have in our war against sin? God. God is on our side. Think about that. I mean, as Christians, when we think about, this is, and I understand why we do this, but when we think of ourselves and our relationship with sin and God, we think, well, God is against us because we're sinners, <laughs> and he's going to judge us. Well, yes, and he did on the cross. If you believe in him, he judged your sin on the cross. He is on your side. He wants to help you fight sin, and this is why I mentioned this last week. That should say 1 John 1, verses 5 to 10, by the way, as well. Not 1 John 5, verse 5 to 10. That reference is written up there wrong. Sorry about that. But this is why I said that our guiding passage for the series is so important. I want you to meditate it and learn on it, learn it and understand what it's saying. Because what does it tell us? It tells us this is the message we've heard from the beginning proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And because God is our ally, and we know that in him is no darkness, to be close to him pushes back the darkness. The more we draw closer to him, the more he helps push back that which is wrong. To be near to God strengthens us in our fight to sin. Hence, you need to rely on your ally, not on yourself. You need to rely. Think about this, right? If Australia had have relied on itself to fight the Japanese in World War II, would we have gotten anywhere? We would have been flogged. I know a lot of Aussies, I actually had Aussies get angry at me for mentioning this. We didn't win that fight. We, we contributed, and our, our, our soldiers were heroes, and they laid down their lives, and they risked their lives. They were heroes. But we didn't win that fight. America won it for us in the Pacific. England helped win it in the, in, you know, in the in the European theater, but without the United States on our side, at least much of Australia would have become, for at least a short amount of time, a Japanese colony. Is that not correct? It's because our leaders were smart enough to recognize we needed to rely on our ally <laughs> that we were able to have victory in that fight. And that's why we can't fight sin on our own. We're not strong enough to fight sin on our own. We will lose. It will drag us down. It, it's stronger than us. The devil is stronger than us. He was one of the mighty angels. He was an archangel. When he wants to set his sights on you, if you try to fight him in your own strength, let's go back to that picture. Does that guy have 
any hope <laughs> against that dragon by himself? Of course not. But if your ally is bigger than the dragon, now there's a chance. There's more than a chance, isn't there? Hence, we need to rely on our ally. God gives us the spirit to empower us to defeat our sin. Feed the spirit of God in you. If God is light, what we need to practically speak in, if God is light, what does light do? What does light do? It exposes things, doesn't it? So if God is light, there is no point in hiding who we really are. Is there? There's no point. It's foolishness. <laughs> he can see everything. We need to be honest with ourselves and we need to be honest with him. Hiding your sin, trying to pretend it isn't an issue, and walking in, is walking in darkness, and it will do you no good. It's fighting sin. It's fighting the dragon by yourself with a puny sword and shield. And you will lose. Over and over again. What we need to do is own our sin. Because it no longer owns us. If you're a believer in Christ, it no longer owns us because we are no longer slaves. We need to own up to it and we need to own it. And we will talk more about this next week when we look at our strategies about how to fight it. But for this morning, I just wanted to encourage you in these two simple ways. Rely on your ally and be open. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, what is walking in the light? If we walk in openness as he is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If, if lying is walking in darkness, then walking in the light means to be honest and open. And it's really important. But for now, know this. If you cannot be honest about your sin, it will continue to dominate you. Darkness will overshadow you if you allow it, but you don't have to allow it. Its defeat begins with being honest. We'll talk about this more next week. For this morning, let's pray. And let's pray to our God. Lord, we thank you so much for all the good things that you give us in your word. And Lord, our desires are still wrapped to that chain. <laughs> and while we are no longer slaves to sin, we are still affected by it. And we need your help. Not one single person in this room is perfect. We haven't even been perfect today. Lord, we need your grace. We need your strength. And we need each other. So Lord, we just pray that as we continue to get into the series and we go deeper and deeper each week, you'd open up our hearts to be responsive to you. Help us to just be honest. Let's begin with just being honest with you about where we're at. Help us to not hide our sin, but to be open about it. And Lord, help us to be strong, strengthened by the power that you give us. You are our ally. Thank you. Help us to fight this battle and to have victories in Jesus' name.